So I want you to take a moment to feel the seat you're sitting in. Is it comfortable? <laughs> Maybe not so much. Now look at the seats around you. Are they beautiful? <laughs> I guess they're not. Um, they're okay seats. They're maybe better than some, but they're just okay. <clears throat> but maybe they're good enough. The seat you're sitting in might not be perfectly comfortable, but it's good enough. The shoes you're wearing are not perfectly fitting, but they're good enough. Why? Imagine a world where you could improve objects to perfection, where things are beautiful and interconnected, and nothing would feel like a compromise. What would that look like? I know it's pure fantasy. But such a world actually exists. It's the natural world. Nature. Think about it. Everything in nature is beautiful and interconnected. This tree here is unbelievably intricate, but then it's also incredibly efficient. Nature used the absolute minimum amount of energy and the absolute minimum amount of material to build a perfect tree. And it was custom designed for this specific location. Imagine if we humans could build objects like that. What would we build? Only our imagination would limit what we're capable of. Now, ever since the cavemen invented the first tools, we have been building stuff essentially the same way, by starting with a big block of material and then removing everything that we didn't want. When you ask Michelangelo how he created his famous sculpture, he said, well, <laughs> I um, chiseled away everything that wasn't David, right? But this is still how we build stuff today. It's kind of insane, but we do it like that. Not nature. Nature doesn't subtract. Nature adds. Nature deliberately puts molecule upon molecule to create the most intricate structures and amazing objects. And it is this complexity and intricacy that enables nature to be so incredibly efficient and functional. Wouldn't it be great if we humans could also build things in this manner? Now, in fact, we can, and we have been doing it for quite a while. Everybody here knows 3D printing, right? Also known as additive manufacturing. A 3D printer works very much the way nature works, by just adding the material that makes up an object. And the printer doesn't care whether it prints something straight or curved, flat or with ornamental patterns. The cost of an object just depends on the amount of material used and not much else. But for the last 30 years, additive manufacturing has mostly been used for prototyping and for lots of little brittle plastic toys. So clearly not revolutionary, but this is changing. Industrial 3D printers have gotten so good that they have quietly entered serial production and they are starting to revolutionize manufacturing. See, when all you're doing is creating a prototype, you're never going to take advantage of the full capabilities of the printer because when it's all said and done, the object needs to be produced on a conventional machine. So all the unique possibilities remain untouched the unique qualities of the process are wasted. But if your final object comes directly out of the printer, things change completely. This is happening now, and in this new paradigm, complexity is free. 
Complexity is free. Think about it. Right now, complexity is the limiting factor. Complexity is the enemy. If you can make something simpler, you will. Complexity is slow. Complexity costs money. Simple is good. And here we are surprised that the world around us is boring, right? But even today, car parts, medical devices, artificial teeth, jewelry, even the decoration of your birthday cake is uh, already 3D printed. And if you've flown in a modern aircraft recently, there were 3D printed metal parts right in the jet engine. This guy looks scared, so no, this, this actually works. So don't be afraid. We are increasingly starting to print entire moving parts, gearboxes, even electric motors. We can work with any material, basically, you know, metals, polymers, glass, ceramics, concrete, natural materials, even living cells. Scientists are starting to 3D print human body parts using your own tissue. It's experimental, but we're getting there. But there's something missing. So you have complete creative freedom in the production process. How do you actually design these objects that can be as complex and intricate as you want? I mean, how would you do it? I mean, sit down and create the blueprint of a tree with all of its functions? It's ridiculous. Where do you even start designing objects like that? Would you really draw them like Leonardo da Vinci did? That's essentially how we still do engineering today. Yes, we use computerized uh, drawing tools that are very, very powerful. But in the end, it's a human expert sitting there, creating something step by step in a really long, laborious process. Leonardo would feel right at home. In a world of unlimited complexity and intricacy, the designer, the engineer, all of a sudden becomes the bottleneck. How do we resolve that? Once again, we have to turn to nature. Nature doesn't really design. Nature experiments. Nature tries stuff out. Some things work, some things don't. When things don't go well, organisms die. It's the old game of evolution, and over a really long period of time, the biosphere became this amazingly complex, entangled ecosystem with a world full of highly adapted organisms. Now we humans need a similar approach. We need to let go of the little details and focus on the big picture. What do I want? What should it do? What do I like? And then let the computer come up with objects in the process of digital evolution. Welcome to the new age of computer-generated parts, structures, and entire machines. For the last four years, my team and I have been working on a new way to create the design of these objects. We want things to be more interesting, more functional, more beautiful, and more sustainable. I brought an object with me today where I can show this off on several levels. Now, this here is a rocket engine. It is an alien object. It was not designed by a human engineer. It was created by a computer. Now, let's forget about the shape for a second. And let's focus on of what it's actually made of. It's metal, in Cornell 718, aerospace grade, Nickel alloy, if you must know. But it's metal unlike anything you've ever seen. Because we used a principle that nature employs all of the time. See, nature doesn't pick one material and then manufacture something out of it. Nature modifies matter actively to get exactly the perfect properties. I give you an example. 
Look at this piece of chalk. Chalk is this brittle, crumbly material that what would not be very useful if you were to build anything out of it, right? Compare it to this seashell, which is strong, almost indestructible. Well, it turns out it is exactly the same material. Chalk is actually made up of seashells that died millions of years ago, so it's exactly the same material. So what's the difference then? The difference is that as the seashell grows, it glues the chalk in place in intricate patterns, microscopic structures that transform the brittle material into something that is extremely strong. Now this is exactly what we have done here in this rocket engine. As this engine was built, we modulated the laser pulses that melted the material so that the crystalline structure of the metal changed. And we did it differently in different areas of the engine. You cannot do this in traditional manufacturing. See, we humans usually pick one material and then we build something out of it. When we need different material properties, we choose different materials, and then we glue, screw, or weld it to other parts to make up the final object. Here in this engine, we emulated nature. The material did not exist in this form, before this engine was printed, it was created in the printer. Now let's look at the shape. I know, maybe you're thinking, what the hell? <laughs> Who designed that? But then, how would you design a rocket engine? Any takers? How would you do it? You would probably hire a skilled engineer, right? who knows exactly how these engines were created in the past. And then you would let her go to work, and she would probably very carefully modify an existing design. Don't go too far in your changes, though. Rockets have a tendency to punish the bold. Now, the way we approached this when we worked with rocket engineers here in Munich was, could they, instead of designing another engine based on the old way, instead teach our software the principles they would apply when they design one. So don't design one, teach us how to design one. And that's what they did. As a result, we had the initial DNA of a rocket engine. We had rules, but we did not have an actual design. The blueprint was created in a process of digital evolution. We automatically generated dozens, hundreds, in the future thousands or millions of different versions, and ran them through physical simulation. Whenever a design didn't work, we killed it. And when it did work, we let it influence the design of the blueprint of the next generation. And after a while, we had rockets that looked different, odd, maybe strange, but which will hopefully work better than the ones that were designed by hand in the past. And by the way, printing this engine here cost exactly the same amount of money as printing a much simpler design. Complexity does not result in higher costs, just like in nature. Now, there's a lot more refinement of the process remaining. We need to learn a lot before this can actually fly, but we're getting there. And you can apply this principle to all areas of engineering to all objects, parts, and tire machines. Right now, we're just scratching the surface of what is going to be possible. For the last years, my team has worked on a <clears throat> way to automatically create the design of these processes. We work with engineers, we work with designers, but we also work with artists. Because in this new paradigm, it doesn't cost anything extra to make something beautiful and elegant, complexity is free, and computing time costs next to nothing. We want to digitize our human knowledge about how we build things, and then let our software come up with new and surprising designs. We want to build the tools to shape a world that is way more interesting, more functional, more beautiful, but also more sustainable than what we have today. Most of our engineering processes have not fundamentally changed 
since our grandfathers and grandmothers invented them. Most of our techniques actually would feel quite familiar to a Roman engineer. Let's take a page out of Mother Nature's cookbook and go the next step. Nature is never wasteful. Nature has created some of the most efficient machinery in the world. Nature is by definition sustainable. Nature is incredibly beautiful and creative. Let us get smarter about the way we build things, because now we can. Work was hard, so man invented the wheel. Work was repetitive and boring, so we invented the modern factory. In the past decades, we invented the microchip, the computer, the internet, and an explosion of creativity ensued. And we built a world that our grandparents would have never imagined. We are at such a historic turning point again. But now we need pioneers all over the world, understand the process, embrace it, and put their heads to work. This new paradigm can help us solve some of the tough global challenges we're facing today. Here's a tool that can truly change the world. Here's a technology that touches on the very foundation on which civilization was built, the way we design and manufacture human artifacts. Well, we need your help, your creativity, your ingenuity, and your imagination. Because now, if you can imagine it, you can build it. Thank you.